What are you optimistic about? On the whole, I like not to think about this question <laughs> because it's, um, it's at a one step forward and two steps backward, as I see over and over again throughout the last 20, 30 years. What do you think some of the concrete actions are that you know, we as a world can take? Concrete actions at the individual level or at the societal level? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I hope you don't think I'm going to be pontifical here because that's not my intention. I can just get some thoughts about where we should go. These ultimately the the road we'll take will depend, at least in democratic societies, I hope, by informed, informed opinion of not only experts, but people who actually experience uh, the loss of natural capital, which includes uh, everyone, not just. Um, we need serious institutional changes, not just changes in the way we measure although the way we measure economic success or what we think is economic success is extremely important because it's, in some sense we react to the idea of whether we are doing well or not, we as a collective, as an as economy. So st sticking to GDP is a very bad idea, no question about that. We really have to move to asset to inclusive wealth or some aspects of it, okay? And we can come back to that issue. What we, should we have? Now, it depends a lot on uh, starting from the household level, I think one of the features of um, our engagement with nature, the human engagement with nature, which makes me more optimistic than if I concentrated uh, on climate change, is the following. Climate change, which has been the source of much of the discussion on our engagement with nature over the past 20 years or so, has one weakness, I mean, the, the f focusing on it has one weakness, which is that a sing an individual could say, look, this is something over which I can't do very much because it's a public bad, you know, conflict. I'm a tiny, fr I'm, one, I'm one eighth billionth of the world, okay? So what I do has no effect, effectively no effect on climate change. And yet I'll be bearing the cost if I start you know, not driving my car or not going abroad in an airplane and so forth. So the incentive to action, direct individual action is, individual incentive for doing that is rather low, too negligible. Whereas with biodiversity, quality of the environment as you see it in the neighborhood has a much, direct, much more direct impact on you. You care about your garden, you care about whether there are trees in your neighborhood, you care about the litter. Never mind what happens to the Amazon, that's a long way off, but your immediate neighborhood matters to you. So in a way we, we react to things going wrong in our neighborhood. And we are of course one of many, and it's not asymmetrical, every, every community feels that way about their local so there is a, I feel there is a hope in that, in the sense that if we can, if it's possible to make these issues much more prominent in public discourse and, and private discourse, then there is a, biodiversity has that edge. Biodiversity conservation has that edge over um, carbon emission problem, if you see what I mean. Okay, so that's at the individual level. There will be an incentive for that. At the community level, again, it depends on where you are. In, in the UK, for example, at where I live in Cambridge, at the community level, there's a good deal of uh, activity, keeping builders away, you know, construction out, and you, know, you, you try and protect the bat population in the, in the local park next to your house or in the neighborhood against encroachment and so forth. And we are going through that now. You know, the pressure to build homes, extend roads, and the desire on the part of residents to keep their local environment, um, maintain some biodiversity is huge now. So that's going on here. Um, at the community level in the poorest parts of the world, I'm afraid the state is often the problem. Because 
they have ideas of their own, which, which again, namely the idea of development. So they could very often exploit the resources of the communities for, for development purposes. And depending on the extent to which democracy is practiced, you have a wide variety of results as you, and I don't need to belabor this point, You're, you should be as familiar as anybody else of that. So that's at the community level. At the national level, I think I've, I like to think that we've traversed it already in that our conception of economic development really needs to change. And inclusive wealth is just an aggregate way of thinking of how to, how, to, that, you know, how, how to take nature into account in the process of economic development. For example, investment strategies should be much more nature-oriented. And I've tried to develop the framework in which that can happen, how you can evaluate projects, investment projects, which if you do it correctly, well, taking nature's scarcity value into account will mean that nature conservation projects will often trump um, projects that expand the road network or you know, trashing your wetland so that you can have more housing there and so forth. It's a matter of, you know, at the end of the day, you're doing cost-benefit analysis. When I say we, community, uh, the, the, the... So there is, there is that. That needs to be done. And we do have the language for it. So I'm not talking about something which can't be done intellectually. Intellectually, it's, it's there. In my own review, there is a good deal of material on that. How we act upon it, of course, depends on the nature of the state. At the international level, it's a different animal altogether. And we've seen that over climate change, negotiations over climate change, because we are looking at now global public goods, like the atmosphere as a sink for our emissions. Um, and you can see that uh, we're pretty hopeless, uh, because we can't, nations have different conceptions of what they want out of this negotiation process. Um, and you can't get commitment. There's no binding treaty. So it's been, on, from my point of view, I think it's been a real uh, sad event that we're st staring at some serious problems and we're not really making. And of course, we haven't really touched on the oceans. Now, it is true, the most recent uh, COP has a 30% earmarked for land and water, which need to be protected. And that's a big, big step, I think. No question about it. But there's a long way to go on these matters as well. I don't know if that makes sense, but I don't think we can, we can identify one set of things to do. It really depends on the scale at which you're operating. Yeah, many different actions needed. Yes. Yeah. What are you optimistic about? On the whole, I like not to think about this question. <laughs> because... It's, um, it's at one step forward and two steps backward, as I see, over and over again throughout the last 20, 30 years, particularly when these issues of biodiversity, I'm concentrating on biodiversity here because so much has been written and spoken about climate change. And in some sense, it's a, that's a very narrow topic. It's narrow because climate change, as I was suggesting, is... Or, or, is only one of uh, climate is one of climate regulation is only one of the services that Mother Nature offers, so it needs to be embedded in all the others. And the real problem is that these, when I say problem, that's not the nature's features, that these services that she offers us, on which we depend entirely for our existence, are complementary to one another, and that's ex uh, for. I think we need to be alert to that. Complementary means that, you know, like the House of Cards is the ultimate example of a complementary set of cards. You take one card off and the whole thing crumbles. But of course, Na Mother Nature is not like that. She's much more resilient. You can, you can insult her for quite a while and she still... But, um, if, but we are so smart now and we are so large as, a as you know, 8 billion people with a lot of intelligence, so to speak, going with it. We can make her into a house of cards if we like, and we are in the process of doing that. So, 
Um, we're just beginning to, as far as I can see, we're just beginning to get an appreciation of the delicacy um, of nature's workings. You know, it's coming from various fields. You know, those who work, the ecologists who work on trees, fungi, they're making us aware over and over again of how delicate uh, this in incredible factory is. It's churning out these services for us. So if, if we, if we, the bad news is we are becoming urbanized in a huge way. I mean, the, the world is. So to the extent that you live in urban areas, you, you lose track of where the milk comes from, where the water comes from, and so forth, how it gets cleaned by nature and so forth. So that's the bad news. The good news is, of course, there's a lot of scientific knowledge now. Uh, ecologists are informing us of many things. And I like to think one of the things that I'm hoping will happen is that more ecologists and earth scientists are employed in government. And not in the, uh, sci uh, not in the science departments of government, but the treasury, finance ministries, and that private banks will hire them because they are needed for an understanding of, of supply chains that investment companies. So I'm sorry, it's a mixed, it's a, I'm evading your question, but that's largely because I like to evade it. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. We really appreciate the conversation and are looking forward to hearing much more from you. Pleasure. <laughs>